Hey guys, how are we doing today? My name is Jay, and I'd like to thank you guys first for clicking on this video. Kudos to you. Now, the purpose of this video will be to discuss um, a specific type of bacteria known as um, Eusinia pestis, and we're going to explore the origin of Eusinia pestis, um, the, the reason we're studying Eusinia pestis, as well as the symptoms that it can cause in both humans and mammals. Um, how humans become infected with Eusinia pestis, as well as um, the history of Eusinia pestis in correspondence with human history and its impacts on human civilization. Now, before I begin all my videos, I'd like to kind of introduce you guys to a little bit about um, both the bacteria and the um, infection. So without further ado, let's, um, let's visit and um, review exactly what a plague is. Now, um, a plague, according to most dictionaries you can find or get your hands on, is any infectious epidemic or pandemic that results in a large fatality count. And when you think of a large fatality count, you can think of other diseases such as polio or smallpox, measles, typhoid, leprosy. The list goes on. But today, we're discussing three very dire and devastating pandemics, all caused by this one very bacteria, Eusinia pestis. Now, usually the diseases that are caused by Eusinia pestis take about 10 to 16 days for people to die on average. Um, people ha have died earlier, and there are three different types of plagues that Eusinia pesti causes that all have different symptoms, very similar symptoms, but different symptoms, and different um, levels of sever sever severity. Now, without further ado, let's, um, let's talk about what kind of plague Eusinia pestis is. Eusinia pestis is... A plague that's naturally found in the wild. It's not it's not something that is human only. It's actually um an infection that's been around for a long, long time. Um it's been around and it's been infecting humans since possibly earlier than the sixth century, but all we have recorded is events from the sixth century. So we don't know anything about it beforehand. So let's um move on and explore the bacteria a little bit. So this is the bacteria uh, Yersinia pestis. Um, it is the causative agent of plague, and it is a very, very fascinating bacteria. Now, I took the um, classification tab from Wikipedia. You can see that it's in the domain bacteria, kingdom, eurobacteria, phylum, proteobacteria, and it's in the family Enterobacteriaceae. And that's the same family that you have um, Yersinia tuberculosis among. So it's sharing many, many, uh, many significant um traits with other Yersinia species, which I won't go into detail in this video because it doesn't pertain to um, the main topic of this video. So, one thing I can tell you is that Yersinia pestis was named um, by a man named Alejandre Yersin, a bacteriologist stationed in Hong Kong in 1894. And his, the reason we care about Alejandre Yersin was because since Biblical times, early medieval period, people often um, always connected pandemics and massive deaths caused by infections with godly punishment and divine cruelty. And that's not the case. I mean, Alejandro Yersin was the first one that was able to link bacteria to um, the plague. And that is the reason why he's remembered today. So here we have some more pictures of Eusinia pestis. This one happens to be the picture of Eusinia pestis under a very 
um, efficient um, microscopic technique known, known as fluorential microscopy. And you can see that it resembles somewhat like, a, you know, medical pills, you know. They're, they're rod-shaped, but they're like a cocco bacillus. They're not quite circular, but they're quite not rod either. They're kind of something in between. And they can stick together very well. And labs often like this because labs could grow this bacterium um, at a very, very good temperature. Now, room temperature is 25 degrees Celsius. These bacteria love to thrive at 26 to 37 degrees Celsius. So they're very, they have a very nice range of growth. And we also know that in, 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 in their wild environment, um, these rod, these negative rod-shaped cacobacilli um, like to undergo facilitative anaerobic, anaerobic um, respiration, which means that when they are in the presence of an oxygen-rich environment where there's an abundance of oxygen, they can create ATP using oxygen. Now, when they're introduced to an area where there is no oxygen, they can undergo fermentation to get ATP, which is really unique. Not many, there are other bacteria that do this, but not many, which um, is a plus in my books. Now, before we could um, sequence the genomes of this bacteria, we weren't 100% sure that this bacteria caused um, all the different um, plagues that I will mention at a later part of this video. But after gene genome sequencing in around 2001, we were 100% confident that it was Eusenia pestis that caused all those unfortunate events in the Middle Ages. So in this video, we will um, talk about briefly the uh, molecular structure of Eusenia pestis. And you can see in this video that Eusenia pestis um, is very, very generic. When you think of a bacteria cell, you think of plasmids, cell walls, cell membranes, cytoplasms, ribosomes, and chromosomal DNA all munched together. Well. This is what you got, and this is what you're going to have to use. And so, in terms of its molecular structure, it's nothing worth bragging about. It's your everyday bacteria. The next thing we'll look at is the genome sequence of Eusenia pestis. And you can see in this picture that Eusenia pestis has about 4.6 million base pairs. And this, this image was taken from... A 2000, August 2001 edition of Nature, a science article that publishes um, some of the most fascinating genome sequencing information pertaining to um, modern science. And this, in this um, article that I read, which is where I got the, vi um, the image from, we can see that Eusenia pestis um, was very, very, very um, rich in insertion sequences. And... We can also see from uh, the number of base pairs it has that it also is very, very rich in um, its ability to undergo frequent recombination. And the strain that they looked at in this, in this um, article was the CO92 strain, which um, consisted of 4.6 megabases of chromosomes, and it contains three plasmids, um, which were all... Um, major contributors to the pathogenicity of this um, pathogen. So they were PMT1, PCD1, and PPCP1. Now, another strain that was looked at while I um, was researching for this video was um, the Kim strain, which consists of about 4.6 um, million base, pair, base pairs as well. But unlike this um, CO92, which has a regular chromosomal uh, structure, the Kim strain had a circular chromosomal structure, and after uh, testing out the chromosomal structure, they found out that it was the Kim strain that was related to the plagues, and possibly either the Kim strain or a ancestral strain that the Kim strain adapted from was the cause of all the plagues. Now, this strain, um, the reason they explained that plague was attributed to this strain was because this strain has a pathogen pathogenicity island factor known as HPI, which it has um, come to gain through horizontal gene transferring and 
it's another major contributor to the pathogenicity of um, Yersinia pestis. Now, this is our oriental rat flea, as you can see. Again, I took the classification tab from Wikipedia. Thank you, Wikipedia. And this is the animal that is responsible for transferring plague from one animal to another animal, from one flea to another flea, from animals to humans, from humans to humans, and in the end, death everywhere. Now, its Latin name is Xenophysilla chiopis, and we know it as the Oriental Rat Flea. Now, this is a very, very, very small, very, very small flea. It's about 2.5 millimeters, and its ideal temperatures is 20 to 25 degrees Celsius. Now, that's roughly room temperature, maybe a little bit colder to room temperature, which is bad because it can live where we live, room temperature. And the funny thing with this animal is that if it's not in a favorable condition where it happens to be hatching, it'll just never hatch until the conditions are met and then it hatches. Now I have two images here. The first one shows the oriental rat flea um, right after sucking blood from a mammal. Chances are it's probably rodent blood. And in the other image I have the oriental rat flea under a microscope containing white pesties. The black stuff um, in its abdomen is um, Yersinia pestis, and what happens is how people get infected with Yersinia pestis happens like this. So let's say you're minding your own business and you have a dog, and a dog likes to catch squirrels, and you happen to live around a population of these unfortunate rat fleas, and you have rats all around your backyard. Of course, you can't see them because they're hiding all over places, but they come out at night and they sleep on your property. And what happens is one of these flies come from an area that was infected, brings the Yersinia pestis bacterium with them. They happen to see a bunch of these rats and your pet dog decides to bite any one of them. Let's say it bites your dog. And once it bites your dog, it gets the blood and becomes what image 2 looks like. But at the same time, all the black stuff in image 1 regurgitates from its abdomen into the blood stream of your dog or the skin of, you know, into your dog. And when that happens, congratulations, your dog has um, the bite. And the flea still has some black matter of white pesties left over. And chills around your house. Then sees that, you know, you're around. So it could, one, bite you. Two, bite the rats in your house. And then three, you have rats dying. And that kind of causes attention. And then you could possibly get it as well. Your dog has it now. And let's say you're not that smart and you decide to clean your dog and you don't wear gloves you don't use you know any safety things well you're gonna get infected and you're gonna get the plague so that's so, so that's how you kinda get it get, get infected but let's uh, let's talk about actually the whole infection cycle of the plague now you know that the plague has uh, three different cycles. The first cycle we're going to talk about is the somatic cycle, also known as the wild cycle, non-human cycle. So you can see in this cycle that infection A, let's say the infected flea um, to the leftmost has Y pestis infection. It bites the wild rodent on top, which then gets infected. Another flea comes, sucks blood from that takes Y pestis from that rodent 
carries it to row number two. Rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat. That's what is supposed to happen. Unfortunately, sometimes these fleas travel far and wide. Reproduce, travel far and wide. And they get into a city. An urban cycle begins. And in an urban cycle, you have rodents like domestic rats and mice and pet guinea pigs, you know, all that stuff. And somehow, ineffectively, gets in, bites them. And somehow, a human gets into contact with a the flea. There you go, you get bubonic plague. And sometimes, humans either are too poor or are too ignorant to seek medical help, so they don't get help. And after. Uh, six to seven, five to seven days, they develop symptoms of bubonic plague. After eight to nine days, the plague spreads from the lymphatic system into uh, um, other parts of your body, specifically your bloodstream, and you get septemic plague, also known as secondary pneumonia. And when, at that point, you should probably get checked out. If you don't think you're smart enough not to get checked out, then give it another week, you're gonna it's gonna infect the lungs. And when it infects the lungs, it becomes pneumonic plague. And at that point, your chance of recovery are very slim, even with um, vaccination and antibiotics. And they will, you know, simplify or reduce the symptoms, but let's say let's say you're the same person that caught the plague to begin with it. You're too ignorant. You don't believe in antibiotics. You think, you know, your body's good enough to, to, to make a recovery. So, what happens at this point is you die. Within 12 to 24 hours, you're dead. After the plague hits your lung area, your, your, your respiratory system, your lungs, you're, you're gone. So, this is a very good infectious um, diagram to read and Go over it. It tells you, you know, everything you need to know in terms of the uh, cyclic effects of the plague. So here's a picture of the plague in great detail. We have the lymphatic system, the circulatory system, as well as the um, mnemonic uh, respiratory system. So each of the, so we got a plague infects the lymphatic system, causes bubbles, enlargement of the lymph nodes. Uh, septemic uh, circulatory system goes a little bit beyond that and causes, starts causing organ shock and internal bleeding. And then the monitor, um plague is where we, we see septis like symptoms like organ failure and system failure and uh, total systematic shutdown of your body and death, low body, low blood temperature, stuff like that. Now, um, just some symptoms of what could happen. First image is the buboes I talked about earlier. The second image is the um, necrosis of the legs, which is a very, very symbolic image of septemic plague. You get uh, necrosis of the legs, uh, fingers, and nose, and possibly sometimes ears as well. Uh, you also get um, when it comes to, when you get pneumonic plague, you're, you get signs of hyperemia and a hemorrhage um, in your lungs. So the host immune system is also really awesome because um, we're talking about how everything happens, but we don't really talk about how um, exactly the immune system responds. So this will conclude my first video. Um, we will talk about the host immune response in the next video. And I hope um, you guys learned something in this video. Um, I certainly had really real fun spending half an hour recording this video, but the second video will begin with the host immune response, which we will talk about in detail, the variance factors that um, the bacteria employs, and then we will begin my favorite part of all, the historical impacts of Y pesties. And we will be we will begin and end the third video with um, talking about prevention, uh, med medication, as well as um, current impact and importance of uh, the plague and Y pesties. So, thank you for watching my video, and I hope you guys enjoyed watching this as much as I did. Feel free to leave comments below on how I can improve my video, and as always, give it a like if you like it, dislike if you dislike it, and please tell me my flaws. This is my first video, so thank you.